this is probably something I'll talk to Amanda much more about, but um, another Reddit question. Uh, when will Claude stop trying to be my uh, puritanical grandmother imposing its moral worldview on me as a paying customer? And also, what is the psychology behind making Claude overly apologetic? So this kind of reports about the experience, a different yeah. angle on the frustration. It has to do with the character. The yeah, so a couple points on this first. One is... Um, like things that people say on Reddit and Twitter or X or whatever it is, um, there's actually a huge distribution shift between like the stuff that people complain loudly about on social media and what actually kind of like, you know, statistically users care about and that drives people to use the models. Like people are frustrated with, you know, things like, you know, the model not writing out all the code or the model, uh, you know, just, just not being as good at, at, at code as it could be, even though it's the best model in the world on code. Um, I, I think the majority of thing of things are about that. Um, uh, but, uh, certainly a, a, a kind of vocal minority are, uh, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of raise these concerns, right. Are frustrated by the model refusing things that it shouldn't refuse or like apologizing too much or just, just having these kind of like annoying verbal ticks. Um, the second caveat, and I just want to say this like super clearly because I think it's like, some people don't know it. Uh, others like n kind of know it, but forget it. Like it is very difficult to control across the board, how the models behave. You cannot just reach in there and say, oh, I want the model to like apologize less. Like you can do that. You can include trading data that says like, oh, the model should like apologize less. But then in some other situation, they end up being like super rude or like overconfident in a way that's like misleading people. So there, there are all these trade-offs. Um, uh, for, for example, another thing is if there was a period during which models, ours, and I think others as well, were too verbose, right? They would like repeat themselves. They would say too much. Um, you can cut down on the verbosity by penalizing the models for, for just talking for too long. What happens when you do that, if you do it in a crude way, is when the models are coding, sometimes they'll say, rest of the code goes here, right? Because they've learned that that's a way to economize and that they see it and then and then, so that leads the model to be so-called lazy in coding, where they, yeah. where they, where they're just like, ah, you can finish the rest of it. Yeah. It's not, it's not because we want to, you know, save on compute or because you know the models are lazy and you know it, it, during winter break or any of the other kind of conspiracy theories that have that have that have come up. It's actually, it's just very hard to control the behavior of the model, to steer the behavior of the model in all circumstances at once. You can kind of, there's this, this whack-a-mole aspect where you push on one thing and like, you know, these, uh, these, these, you know, th th these other things start to move as well that you may not even notice or measure. And so one of the reasons that I, that I care so much about, uh, you know, kind of grand alignment of these AI systems in the future is actually these systems are actually quite unpredictable. They're actually quite hard to steer and control. Um, and this version we're seeing today of you make one thing better, it makes another thing worse. Uh, I think that's that's like a present day analog of future control problems in AI systems that we can start to study today, right? I think I think that 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 difficulty in in steering the behavior and in making sure that if we push an AI system in one direction, it doesn't push it in another direction in some in some other ways that we didn't want. Uh, I think that's that's kind of an that's kind of an early sign of things to come. And if we can do a good job of solving this problem, right? Of like you ask the model to like you know to like make and distribute smallpox and it says no, but it's willing to like help you in your graduate level virology class. Like how do we get both of those things at once? It's hard. It's very easy to go to one side or the other and it's a multidimensional problem. And so, uh, I, you know, I think these questions of like shaping the model's personality, I think they're very hard. I think we haven't done perfectly on them. I think we've actually done the best of all the AI companies, but still so far from perfect. Uh, and I think if we can get this right, if we can control the the you know control the false positives and false negatives in this this very kind of controlled present day environment, we'll be much better at doing it for the future. When our worry is, you know, will the models be super autonomous? Will they be able to you know make very dangerous things? Will they be able to autonomously you know build whole companies? And are those companies aligned? So, so I, I think of this, this present task as both vexing, but also good practice for the future. 
what's the current best way of gathering sort of user feedback, like uh, not anecdotal data, but just large scale data about pain points or the opposite of pain points, positive things, so on. Is it internal testing? Is it yeah. a specific group testing, A-B testing? What, what, uh, what works? So, so, so typically, um, we'll have internal model bashings where all of Anthropic, Anthropic is almost a thousand people. Um, you know, people just, just try and break the model. They try and interact with it various ways. Um, uh, we have a suite of evals uh, for, you know, oh, is the model refusing in ways that it, that it couldn't? I think we even had a certainly eval because, you know, our, our model, again, at one point model had this problem where like it had this annoying tick where it would like respond to a wide range of questions by saying, certainly I can help you with that. Certainly I would be happy to do that. Certainly this is correct. Um, uh, and so we had a like certainly eval, which is like how, how often does the model say certainly, uh, uh, but, but look, this is just a whack-a-mole. Like, like what if it switches from certainly to definitely like, yeah. uh, uh, so, you know, every time we add a new eval and we're, we're always evaluating for all the old things. So we have hundreds of these evaluations, but we find that there's no substitute for human interacting with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much like the ordinary product development process. We have like hundreds of people within Anthropic bash the model. Then we do, uh, you know, then we do external A-B tests. Sometimes we'll run tests with contractors. We pay contractors to interact with the model. Um, so you put all of these things together and it's still not perfect. You still see behaviors that you don't quite want to see, right? You know, you see, you still see the model like refusing things that it just doesn't make sense to refuse. Um, but I, I, I think trying to, trying to solve this challenge, right? Trying to stop the model from doing, you know, genuinely bad things that, you know, know what everyone agrees it shouldn't do, right? You know, everyone, everyone, you know, everyone agrees that, you know, the model shouldn't talk about, you know, I, I don't know, child abuse material, right? Like everyone agrees the model shouldn't do that. Uh, but, but at the same time that it doesn't refuse in these dumb and stupid ways. Uh, I think, I think draw, drawing that line as finely as possible, approaching perfectly is still, is still a challenge and we're getting better at it every day, but there's, there's a lot to be solved. And again, I would point to that as, as an indicator of a challenge ahead in terms of steering much more powerful models.